Okay, uh, we're off to uh, chapter seven here. Uh, so last time we talked about uh, equations, reactions, really balancing equations. Uh, in this chapter, we're going to talk about ways to uh, classify reactions. As we will see in this chapter, um, you could look at the same reaction and there are multiple ways at which you can classify that particular reaction. So uh, there's really kind of two big classes of reactions that we're going to talk about. And we're gonna talk about kind of more specific classifications that we could look at uh, that sort of fall under those sort of big umbrellas of classification. All right, so when we talk about reactions, as we will see really in this chapter, there really is kind of two big classifications of reactions. Uh, one is double displacement reactions, and the other ones are really redox reactions. And again, you could think of these type of reactions as sort of the big classifications that you could classify reactions as. And again, underneath each of these, as we will see as we go through this chapter, uh, there's more kind of specific ways you can classify the reaction, uh, sort of maybe based on what's occurring. Uh, in that particular uh, chemical equation. So the first thing we're gonna kind of talk about is a lot of reactions do take place in an aqueous environment. Uh, aqueous are guys that have the AQ symbol uh, next to it. If something is aqueous, it really is uh, what is oftentimes referred to as a solution. So a majority of all the reagents that we sort of use in lab are really aqueous solutions. And we'll talk more about solutions later on as well, but right for now, uh, it's important to actually know again that there's actually two parts to a solution. Uh, the first part of the solution is uh, really the smaller part. And that is what is sometimes referred to as the solute. And the larger part of the solution is what is referred to as the solvent. Uh, again, I we might, but, or maybe even the other day, uh, again, there is a difference between liquid and something that is aqueous. Again, aqueous are typically solutions and is usually made dissolving something, uh, which is the solvent, but not always. Um, so again, if you took water, which is a pure liquid, as we have talked about, and you take some solid sodium chloride, this case, this would be the solvent. Uh, this would be the solute in this case. Again, the solute would dissolve in the solvent, which is water, and what you'd be left with basically is some salt water, uh, which is again, a sodium chloride uh, solution that would get the aqueous sort of symbol to it. Um, <clears throat> thank you. So in addition to sort of understanding certain types of reactions, especially things like uh, double displacement reactions and so forth, is the idea of what are referred to as electrolytes. Uh, electrolytes are basically substances that go for a swim. And when they go for a swim, they basically will produce ions in solution. When they produce ions in solution, uh, the presence of those ions as they're floating around the solution kind of helps complete like the electric. And they're able to conduct electricity, you know, in some cases really well. Uh, in other cases, not so well. And in some cases, they may not be able to conduct electricity. Uh, but really, an electrolyte, again, is sort of the presence of these ions that are floating around in the solution. And again, it's those positive negative charged ions that you know, help it uh, really conduct electricity. A non-electrolyte is really something that will still dissolve in solution, uh, but really it will not produce any electricity and it's really because it doesn't produce any ions. So when we talk about electrolytes, there's really sort of three classes of electrolytes. And we'll come back to this slide here in just a second, but let's talk about those three here. First off, again, we have basically a strong electrolyte. And if you have something that is a strong electrolyte, what that means is 100% of it when it goes into solution will break apart. So technically speaking, when we talked about that sort of sodium chloride solution that we made, 
in the actual solution itself, there's absolutely no sodium and chlorine units still together. They're basically not together at that point when you make that solution. What you have in that solution is this guy will 100% break apart into its ions, which is sodium ions and chloride ions. And again, 100% is the presence of these ions. Because it basically 100% breaks apart into its ions, none of it stays together. It produces a lot of ions in that solution. And as I mentioned before, that makes it really why it's a strong electrolyte. It will actually conduct electricity really well. So there used to be an old experiment a lot of schools used to do. I don't think they do it here though. But uh, you could take like a light bulb, for example, have some electrodes hooked up to it. And you put those sort of electrodes into a strong electrolyte solution. Uh, the light bulb would come on and it'd be very, very bright. So it would conduct electricity really well. So a lot of times the books will show that picture like a bright light bulb will definitely turn on. Now, the next type of electrolyte is really a weak electrolyte. And a little bit different than a strong electrolyte is actually when you have a weak electrolyte, when it's in solution, it actually stays together mostly. So it mainly will stay together a weak electrolyte, but it still has the ability to produce a few ions that are floating around that solution. So it will mainly stay together. But it will produce a few ions in solution. So for example, hydrofluoric acid is an example of a weak electrolyte. It breaks apart into H plus and F minus. So unlike a strong electrolyte in solution, it is actually this guy here still together is mainly what you have. but it is still able to produce a few of these guys. And since it's able to actually still produce a few ions in solution, it's actually still able to conduct electricity. Um, it cannot conduct electricity anywhere near a strong electrolyte. So if we kind of use our light bulb example, if you kind of stuck it into a weak electrolyte solution, the light bulb would turn on, but it would look super dim. Like it would look really dim, like it's almost dying, but it would still have enough in there to really conduct electricity and still be able to sort of power it, if you will. But again, it would be nowhere as bright as, you know, what you have in a strong electrolyte. So kind of like a dim light bulb here. The other really important thing that we oftentimes will see with weak electrolytes is actually the differences in the arrows. Uh, if you kind of look at a strong electrolyte, we have basically an arrow heading in one direction and basically everything's gonna kind of dump out into the product side, basically in that case. In a weak electrolyte, because it mainly stays together but still is able to break apart a little bit, we typically get these arrows that head in both directions. And this means that this type of reaction is a reversible reaction. And that means there's basically two directions. There's the forward direction, which heads from reactants to products. And at some point when you kind of build up enough products, what will happen is those products will head back the other way and it'll go from products back to reactants. And that is what is sometimes referred to as the reverse direction when it has from products back to reactants. If you continue on and take 1B at some point, that's these type of reactions are pretty much all you talk about. At some point, it will reach what is known as equilibrium. And basically what that means is you don't have the same amount of those guys on both sides, but the rate at which it goes sort of in the forward direction will equal the rate at which it's coming back the other way. So essentially what that does, because the rate of both ways basically equal each other, uh, when it does reach equilibrium, wherever everybody is in terms of their concentration, they kind of get locked into place because just as quick as you go that way, it comes back that way, sort of locked everybody into place in terms of their concentration of where they're at. So, you know, if you're looking at an equation and you have to decide maybe, you know, is it a weak electrolyte or a strong electrolyte? And they do sort of write the arrows correctly there. 
if you do see those double headed arrows, it's definitely going to be on a weak electrolyte sort of situation. Any questions on that so far? <clears throat> the last one that we saw in the previous second here, which is really non electrolytes. And non electrolytes, as I mentioned, will dissolve in solution. But the difference here is it does not create any ions. And that's really the important part here because it does not create any ions in solution. Uh, there's no ions really to help conduct electricity. So it does not conduct electricity um, in this case. So an example of that, you know, as we all probably have done before, if we take some sugar, right? And we kind of dissolve it in water, uh, the, the, the sugar will dissolve. But sugar is basically made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And those are all nonmetals, which means they will be all covalently bonded together. They're not going to break apart into any ions or anything like that. Uh, so even though, again, it dissolves the absence in this case of any actual ions flowing in that solution is what makes it a non-electrolyte and really will not conduct electricity uh, in this particular case. <clears throat> any questions on strong, weak, or non-electrolyte? Now, if we had pure water, is pure water a good conductor of electricity? Actually, if you have pure water, which is H2O, um, it is a bad conductor of electricity because it's covalently bonded, which means there's really no ions in that solution. Now, clearly, you know, again, uh, the water coming out here faucet is not pure water. And to clean water, they actually put ions in it a lot of times to actually clean the water. There's a lot of ions in the water. So please don't go blow dry your hair in the shower because you will get electrocuted. <laughs> yes. Um, but if you have, technically speaking, pure, pure water, nothing else in there, because it's all really just covalently bonded molecules together, no ions, uh, it actually would be a, a bad conductor of electricity. I think if you took something like we talked about, sodium chloride solution is a very good conductor of electricity, very good, strong electrolyte. But if you took just the solid sodium chloride and kind of put the little light bulb thing in it, uh, it would not conduct electricity either. Again, in the solid state, ions still together. You need really for it to conduct electricity really well, those ions to be free and kind of floating around in the solution to allow everything to sort of conduct electricity. Any questions on that? <clears throat> So take home messages, don't blow dry your hair in the shower. So some strong electrolytes, um, pretty much most ionic compounds are pretty much strong electrolytes. So things like sodium chloride, uh, potassium, iodide here, calcium chloride, all these guys we would expect to 100% break apart in solution and produce all those ions that are basically flying around or floating around. Uh, characteristics of strong electrolytes, again, um, Kind of one hundred percent break apart, as we'll see in just a second. You know what allows it to break apart is an interaction really between the ions, for example, and something like water. Uh, water, which is polar, uh, will surround the ions, as we'll have a much better picture in just a second. But like the oxygen side, which is the negative side of water, will basically surround the positive guy. The hydrogen side of water, which is really the positive side, will surround the negatively charged ion. And that's really what allows something to sort of dissolve into uh, water. And it really is, you know, what we kind of use the aqueous symbol for a lot of times. So we don't have to write all the waters that are technically there. So it implies that, you know, there's a lot of water involved in, in a lot of those uh, situations. Now, when we talk about acid and bases, those are very common places where we do see sort of electrolytes that could do come into play. A lot of strong acids and also strong bases are strong electrolytes. Uh, hydrochloric acid, nitric acid are strong acids, which means when you have those guys in solution, they 100% break apart. What a definition of an acid is, as we might've talked about, I think when we we're doing nomenclature, is really the ability to produce H plus ions in solution, free H plus ions floating around is really what makes something an acid. And because we get something like hydrochloric acid here that 100% breaks apart into these ions, what we essentially do when we have a strong acid is 
we have a solution that has a lot of free H plus floating around in the solution. And that's why it is considered a strong acid. Same thing happens with bases. If you have something like sodium hydroxide, it is also a strong base, which will 100% break apart into sodium ions and hydroxide ions. And really the definition of a base is the ability to produce hydroxide or OH minus in solution. And it's really the same sort of idea as the acid. When you have a strong base, it's gonna 100% break apart into those ions, thus producing a lot of free OH minus in that solution really quickly. And that's why, again, it's considered really a strong base. By the way, a reminder of some strong acids, which is always good to sort of think about uh, you have hydrochloric acid, which is a strong acid, nitric acid, uh, you have perchloric acid, uh, you have hydrobromic acid, hydroiodic acid, uh, sulfuric acid. So these are some examples of some strong acids, which if you come across those, you should think of them as being strong electrolytes, which will 100% break apart into solution. Uh, some strong bases are a lot of the bases that pretty much have hydroxide in the formula. So uh, sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, uh, calcium hydroxide, and so forth. So if you look on the periodic table, pretty much anybody kind of in group one or group two on the periodic table that has OH in the formula is typically your strong bases. Actually, if you just start at like lithium over there and kind of go down to potassium, make a right and go down, the strontium and barium guy uh, with hydroxide are typically your strong bases. So not all bases obviously have hydroxide in it, but definitely our strong ones definitely a lot of times will have OH in the actual formula. And on the bottom there is acetic acid, which is another example of a weak acid. Again, we see our arrows and in solution, it is mainly going to stay together just like hydrofluoric acid but we will produce a few of these guys on this side. Uh, so uh, acetic acid is a weak acid. Some other common weak acids, hydrofluoric, as we talked about, uh, nitrous acid, hydrocyanic acid. Um, so these are some examples of some weak acids that you know, commonly sort of pop up. Definitely HF, HNO2, acetic acids, so almost a go-to acid for a weak acid for people to talk about is like acetic acid. Also a reminder that sometimes people will write this as C2, H4O2 is the same thing. So again, sometimes people will just kind of give you that sort of formula for it. Any questions on that? <clears throat> Uh, water is really an effective uh, solvent for a lot of ionic compounds. And again, it's really because water is a polar molecule. And as we talked about with bonding, that means obviously there's a side to water that's more positive and a side to water that is more negative. And again, it is the oxygen part that's more negative as I drew on the last slide and the hydrogen part of water, which is more positive. And that's why it works really well for ionic compounds and it's used as a solvent for a lot of situations because basically what happens is what I drew there and what we see on probably on the next slide, again, water molecules are able to really surround all of those ions in solution. And that's why also it visually looks to us like the solid just like disappeared, right? We can't really see it anymore, but it's actually still there. Again, it just gets surrounded by so many waters that visually we can't really see it anymore. And I think we did a number of experiments early on in the semester where we took some solution, we heated off the water, right? And we were left with sort of the solid left at the end. And again, that just shows the, the process of making a solution, uh, which is a homogeneous mixture is a physical sort of process as obviously the salt part is still there. Also means, as we'll talk about also in a later chapter, that you know, although we think about water oftentimes as a very good solvent, it is not always the right solvent in every situation. Uh, so for example, if you remember earlier on, we did that experiment where we did all those halogens and we got the different layering that were happening in those test tubes. Uh, the halogens like Cl2, Br2, those guys are nonpolar molecules. 
which means that water is a really crappy solvent for it. And that's why when we kind of had a water and the halogens together, we saw different layering happening in that test tube. And that's because they really won't mix. And as we'll talk about in later chapter, the purpose of that and why they really don't mix is because they're both trying to use different ways of interacting with each other. And the only way that things really mix really well with one another is if everybody's using kind of the same type of interaction that they normally use with themselves. And that is an idea we'll hear later on in a couple of chapters, I think, uh, which is referred to as like dissolves like. So things that work very similar, things that have similar interactions with themselves are able to be really soluble and mix really well uh, with uh, guys that also carry the similar type of interactions. So let's now talk about ways to classify reactions. And the first sort of big way of classification that we're really gonna be talking about here are double displacement reactions. And I think along the way, we've, we talked about sort of this reaction, but this is sort of, again, the big umbrella for which a more specific way of classifying reactions can occur. In a double displacement reaction, you basically have two things reacting. And the key of these two things are that they are ionic compounds, which means you basically have a positive guy and a negative guy and a positive guy and a negative guy together. And 100% of the time in this type of reaction, what's going to happen is the two positive guys are simply going to switch partners. So what ends up happening is we produce two new ionic compounds on the product side. So in this case, negative and positive has to come together or positive and negative is a better way of saying that. So the A has only one option here. It's got to hook up there with the D to make this new ionic compound. And the other option is obviously C, which is positively charged, has to go and bind with the negatively charged B in that case and make another new ionic compound. So this is ultimately the, the overall reaction that occurs in all double displacement reactions. And there's really two sort of subclassifications that fall under that double displacement uh, re equations or reactions. And those are, as we see here, precipitation reactions, which means that we do get a solid that forms, which is sometimes referred to as a precipitate. So what that means in one of these cases, we get a solid that would form as a result of mixing these solutions together. The other sort of one that we'll talk about as well that falls under this umbrella are acid-base reactions. And what typically happens in an acid-base reaction is actually the formation of water. That's basically what happens. So the result of that is one of these guys on the right-hand side ends up making H2O in that particular case. Why is this important? When we talk about chemical reactions, there's really three reasons why a chemical reaction actually takes place. And they're sometimes referred to as the driving forces for chemical reactions. And those three driving forces are the formation of a solid, or a precipitate, like we have in precipitation reactions, the formation of water, like we have in acid-base reactions. And the third is the next big class of reactions, which is the transfer of electrons, which occurs in what we'll talk about a little bit later on in this chapter, reactions which are referred to as redox reactions is when we have electrons being transferred. So those are really the three main reasons why when we put things together, we go, oh, a chemical reaction has occurred because we want to either form water, we want to make a solid, are there some type of electrons being transferred in that particular reaction. So double displacement reactions pretty much cover the first two reasons, you know, why reactions take place that precipitate being formed or that water actually being formed. Any questions on that? <clears throat> so let's take a little closer look at precipitation reactions, which again are our double displacement. <clears throat> 
So in a precipitation reaction, a precipitate is formed. And again, a precipitate is sometimes abbreviated as PPT. And it is a result of a lot of times just simply taking two solutions together and mixing them. And the reason it often happens with two solutions is, as we just talked about, a solution is basically a homogeneous mixture. And in a solution, in a lot of cases, you have a lot of ions floating around. So when you mix them together, all those ions then can come together. And depending on sort of the combination of ions that might come together, it may actually result in a solid being formed. As you might've saw uh, the other day when we did the precipitation part of the experiment, when we talk about a precipitate, sometimes people think, oh, it's gotta maybe be like a rock hard solid that's just gonna, gonna drop to the bottom. And that's not really always the case in a precipitation reaction. A precipitate could be any type of solid that is formed. Uh, again, it can look in your test tube like it's got cloudier. There's some stuff floating around that wasn't there before. Those are all considered, you know, a precipitate. Uh, today's experiment, we're going to basically make a precipitate, a yellow precipitate, uh, when we kind of mix a couple of things together. But it always will involve something that ends up being solid. And again, a more specific way to classify the reaction is a precipitation reaction when that occurs. The sort of bigger way of classifying it is as a double displacement reaction. So if we look at this reaction and you might be wondering like, you know, how do I know this is a double displacement reaction? It really starts with looking at what's on the reactant side that has led to nitrate. That definitely is a positive guy and a negative guy. That is sodium iodide, which is also a positive guy and neg negative guy. There's no other reaction other than a double displacement reaction in which you get that two combination right there. Two ionic compounds coming together is basically always going to be a double displacement reaction when you see that combination happening on the reactant side. So what does that mean? It's what we really see here. Our lead, which is positively charged, will go over and hook up there with the iodide, which is negatively charged, and we get lead to iodide over here. Our positive sodium will then go over and hook up with the negatively charged uh, nitrate, uh, which makes our sodium nitrate on this side. So this is a very common mistake a lot of people make in this case when we look at the molecular equation, are they are given something like this. And they're asked to write what happens on the other side. And earlier when we we're talking about balancing equations in the last chapter, I talked about the idea that it's really important to get the correct formulas first and then balance the equation. But very commonly, people will look at this and go, all right, that's like, uh, you know, NaNO32, because there's like a two there. And I need to do a little PBI over here and kind of put it together incorrectly because they're trying to balance and write the formulas at the same time. So remember, you don't want to do that. When you have to predict what goes on the other side, again, you want to get the correct formulas. So when we look at this, which is lead two, the two basic units of this is a lead with a plus two charge, and it is nitrate with a minus one charge, regardless that there's two of them at this point. The basic unit of this guy is a sodium with a plus one charge and an iodide with a minus one charge. So when you put them together, what you're really putting together is a lead with a plus two charge and an iodide with a minus one charge. So just like we did with nomenclature, we need more of the I and we get the correct formula down here. Same thing here. This is basically a sodium with a plus one charge. This is nitrate with a minus one charge. So again, here, when we put it together, this is the correct formula like we see up there on top. At this point, once you now have the correct formulas, now you can take care of the balancing part. And at this point, we would balance it by doing the coefficients. I got two nitrates on the left. I probably need a two there. And I got uh, now two sodiums, which I need a two there. And clearly my two got lost up here, which there should have been as well. And now we have it correctly balanced uh, in this particular case. So 
It is a very common mistake when people are asked to sort of write what's on their side, like you will probably have to do, obviously, in that experiment we did the other day, right? You have to kind of write the completed equation. You want to always make sure that you're starting with the correct formulas and then balance, not try to do them both together. Super common error that people make. Any questions on that? Yeah. No, there's, we're going to talk about why uh, in, in just a second here. I, I think your question of, of why is there a solid maybe that forms and stuff like that um, and, and why this occurs in the next couple of slides. So I, I think we'll get to your probably question here. But first off, when we do look at this and we do have this equation balance, which is the molecular equation, this is what is referred to as the molecular equation where we just basically write the obviously correct formulas down. Uh, we do... Uh, basically balance it but because really all these guys are aqueous except for something obviously there that's a solid and this again is why this is a precipitate reaction because that is our precipitate that was made as a result of this is actually the same one you're going to make later today a nice yellow solid i think along the way um what's really happening in the solution as we talked about is these things are really strong electrolytes which means they're really not sort of staying together in solution so we can write another equation which really describes sort of what is happening uh, in this reaction. Again, on your notes, I don't know if the two got lost or not, but make sure the two is there. Uh, we can write this guy and break these guys apart into their ions. And if we do that, as I just mentioned, what we have here is basically lead with a plus two charge. This is really nitrate with a minus one charge, but there are two of them. So we do bring the two in the front and that really represents, you know, in solution, what we have going on. Same thing here, this guy, when it breaks apart would be a couple of sodium ions floating around plus a couple of iodide ions. And again, all these guys would be aqueous, which basically means they are free in that solution. They're floating around. And again, these guys are really strong electrolytes. And that's how we know they're floating around. Now, if we have something that's a solid, it is not free those ions anymore. Basically what happened is those two ions came together and they sort of bonded together sort of ionically there and made this solid that basically appeared. So when we would do in a case where we have something that's a solid is actually we would still keep it together. Because again, if it was not together, it wouldn't be a solid at that point. It would just be floating around. So those guys, because they came together to make that solid, are going to stay together. And then basically what we have here at the end is a couple of sodium ions that are floating around and a couple of nitrate ions that are floating around as well. So this reaction that I just wrote here, which is down here, is what is sometimes referred to as the total ionic equation, our complete ionic equation. And this equation really does describe sort of what is going on in this reaction. What is basically going on in this reaction is we got those ions that are broke apart. They're floating around the solution. We have some ions that come together uh, to make a solid. When you write the total ionic equation or the complete ionic equation, there's a few things that you never break apart. Obviously solid like we see here stays together because as we just talked about, otherwise it wouldn't really be a solid. Things that are a liquid like water also stays together. Again, liquid is, or something that's a liquid typically will be covalently bonded together and will not break apart into ions. The other thing that we commonly also keep together are gases. If you happen to have something that's a gas, obviously it's not going to break apart into ions. But the last thing that we really do keep together is if you could recognize something as a weak electrolyte, like we talked about earlier, a weak electrolyte, when you get to a total ionic equation, you basically will keep together. So there's a few things that we do not break apart. In this type of equation, again, anything that is a solid, anything that is a liquid, anything that really is a weak electrolyte 
will not break apart. And like I said, if you happen to come across a gas, that also typically will not break apart as well. So that really means anything that's sort of ionic that you know you could recognize as a strong electrolyte, which is most ionic compounds, uh, will break apart unless obviously it is the guy that is making a solid and it would stay together. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> now, when we look at this total ionic equation, you will always be able to look on both sides of the equation and you'll be able to find ions that look exact the same on both sides of the equation. And if we look in this particular case on the left-hand side, there is a nitrate or a couple of nitrates. And on the right-hand side, there's a couple of nitrates. On the left-hand side, there's a couple of sodium ions. And on the left-hand side, that's a couple of sodium or vice versa there in terms of left and right. And when we find ions that look exactly the same on both sides of the arrow, these are what are referred to as spectator ions. So if you are a spectator, you are doing what? You are typically just watching, yes? And that's basically what these guys are doing. Uh, you're not really involved in what's going on. And that's exactly what is happening with these ions. They're basically there just to balance out the charge of everybody, but they are really being formed in this reaction. So what is actually taking place, what is actually being formed in this reaction, these ions are not involved in them. Typically what we do is we take these spectator ions and we basically just cross them out when we get to our total ionic equation. And what that gives us is a third type of equation that is commonly used for double displacement reactions what is referred to as the net ionic equation. So the net ionic equation is basically what is left over after you get the spectator ions in the case of this. And if we get rid of those spectator ions in this case, which again was our nitrate and our sodium, we are left with what is truly taking place when you mix those two solutions together. It is the lead two ion from the lead two nitrate that's going to go find the iodide ion from the sodium iodide. And those guys are going to come together to make the solid that we would see here, this yellow solid. And this is what is known as the net ionic equation. So the net ionic equation basically gets rid of everything. It cuts right down to the heart of the matter and goes, basically when you dump this together, it's this ion and this ion coming together to make this solid in the case of a precipitation reaction. Any questions on any part of that there? Yeah. So are you asking how a question would be yeah. asked? Yeah. So a question could be asked a couple of different ways. You may be given the, the molecular equation, for example, and may be asked to write the total ionic equation and the net ionic equation and identify the spectator ions. Uh, you may also have a situation where you get just maybe the front part of it, the reactants part, reaction, reactants, there it is, reactants, and has to predict the products like we kind of did a second ago, and then go from there from the, to the molecular, to the total, to the net ionic equation. A lot of times as you maybe continue on in chemistry and like Chem 1A or Chem 1B, a lot of times uh, you, you do have to, a lot of questions will ask you, you know, what is the net ionic equation? Because a lot of times that's ultimately what you're interested in in a lot of reactions is really what's kind of coming together and reacting. So as you continue on with chemistry, a lot of times people do focus in a lot on the net ionic equation. Uh, but for our class here, it would be probably a question like that, you know, like either here's the equation or complete this equation and write the total ionic, the net ionic and identify spectator ions. Other questions? <clears throat> So you will always have, like I said, a solid that forms here uh, to resolve this double displacement.
steps to kind of do these three equations. So you do need to be able to obviously write your equation. Total ionic equation. I, and do the net ionic equation, obviously identify the spectator ions there. Any questions on that? <clears throat> so the question might also be like, how do I know if I kind of put these guys together, you know, am I going to get a solid or not going to get a solid? That's where something known as solubility rules come into play. Things that uh, are solubility rules, which helped us understand you know, if we get this sort of combination of ions that come together, would we expect a solid to form or not form? Uh, we, we had a little bit of that solubility table in like one of those way early labs where it was that table where it was like uh, and the S's and N and, you know, you put your fingers together in the boxes. That was like a post lab question, I think. But um, when we look at something or think about solubility rules, it's oftentimes broken up into three categories. And in most cases, kind of two categories, really. Uh, that is things that are considered soluble. So if you look at solubility rules and it says this combination is soluble, what that means is it typically will get the aqueous symbol and you would expect no solid to form. If you look up on the solubility table and it says this thing is insoluble, it basically means the opposite. It means that we would expect a solid to form in this case. And those guys would get the solid sort of symbol next to them. And we would expect a solid to form. Doesn't happen a lot with solubility rules, but it can happen. There are certain things which are considered number two here which is slightly soluble. And it pretty much implies uh, what the name says. It means it has some degree of solubility. In most cases, 99% of the time, most people would consider, if you looked up on a table and said, this thing is slightly soluble, that most of the time, it would be more third sort of thought of as being insoluble. Um, so, We'll go with that as well. So if you see something that's slightly soluble, you can kind of think of it as being more insoluble than soluble. But it really does have some degree of solubility. Uh, something you know, that we won't get into in this class, but again, if you continue on to 1B. Rules as like 100% of the time, it's correct. It's always going to occur. And things that are technically from this, solubility rule to say when you put these two things together it's insoluble and you should get a solid there are a lot of factors that are involved as to whether or not you will actually see the solid form or not and there's things like the concentration of the ions in solution things like ph and some other factors that really do affect solubility and if you take one b there's a whole chapter on all that kind of stuff that you'll learn about uh, but for us, again, we'll think of them as almost being sort of 100% of the time, that's what's going to happen. But the truthful answer is that's not really the case. It's not really 100% of the time, but we sort of think of these rules as like, for sure, you know, that's what's going to take place. So let's look at some of these rules here. And there's solubility tables and rules are sometimes displayed in many different ways. Like I said, if you go back and look what we had in that particular, um, you know, there's come sometimes boxes. S or I, meaning soluble or insoluble. So what we are seeing here are the solubility of ionic compounds in water. That's from one on the periodic table. So that's like your lithium, your sodium, your potassium. As soon as you see that element in your compound, you're going to know it's going to be soluble 100% of the time. So as soon as you see it, you basically could lay up an aqueous symbol next to that guy and know that it's going to be soluble. You wouldn't expect any type of solid to form. So as well, if you have something that has ammonium in it, which is NH4 plus, that also is soluble 100% of the time, and it will yield you something that is aqueous, and you wouldn't expect a solid to form as a result of that. Guys that contain nitrate, chlorate, or perchlorate, also same deal. You know, nitrate's a very common one we come across a lot. It was in the previous example. 
If you ever looked at a lot of the bottles that we use in class in lab, it's like something nitrate, something nitrate. Again, they use nitrate because it's soluble pretty much in everything. And again, you would expect a aqueous symbol basically to occur. If you have something that has chloride, bromide, or iodide in it, it will be soluble. But there actually are some exceptions to that. So in most cases, if you have a chloride, a bromide, or an iodide, we would expect it to be soluble, no solid being formed. But there's actually three exceptions. And the three exceptions are right there, which is silver, that's mercury one, and that is lead two. So if you have something that is a chloride, a bromide, or an iodide that also contains silver, lead, or mercury, it becomes the opposite of it. So normally those things are soluble. So if you have something that had one of those three guys in it, it would then become insoluble and it would make a solid if you had one of those guys in it. So unlike the, the previous ones that we just talked about, there are no exceptions for those guys. So as soon as you see any of those guys above there, you're good to go, it's going to be aqueous. But if you have something that is chloride, bromide, or iodide in it, you got to make sure it does not contain silver, lead, or mercury. And if it does, it is going to be solid in that particular case. Most sulfite, sulfates are soluble. But again, there are some exceptions, except for calcium and silver sulfate, which is slightly soluble, again, leaning towards being insoluble. And barium, mercury, or lead, which are insoluble. So if you have a sulfate that contains one of these guys, basically, along with probably the calcium and the silver slightly, uh, these would be the opposite, which means they would be soluble, uh, insoluble and make a solid. And obviously, anything that is mostly with sulfate would be aqueous. So with solubility rules, there are certain things that there are no exceptions. As soon as you see them, always going to be soluble. And there are certain things that are pretty much, in most cases, going to be soluble, except if you got some type of those exceptions. So it goes to the opposite spectrum there and becomes insoluble. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> now, what we looked at here on this slide are things that are mostly soluble. There are things as well that are mostly insoluble, which are some of these guys on this slide. So when we look at these guys, these guys are mostly insoluble, which means most of these guys will make a solid if they are present. But there are some exceptions. So in most cases, hydroxides here will be a solid, except for the same exceptions that we saw on the previous slide which is everybody in group one, barium and calcium. So if you have anybody in group one with a hydroxide, like sodium hydroxide, like potassium hydroxide, um, calcium hydroxide, barium hydroxide, they will be the opposite of insoluble. They will then become soluble. So the opposite in that case. If you have anything that is a carbonate, phosphate or sulfide, they are normally, in a lot of cases, going to be insoluble and produce a solid. A lot of sulfides do that. And also, if you take 1B, you will know that for sure because it stinks. And you do a lot of experiments where you make sulfides in a lot of those experiments. And there are a lot of insoluble things. Now, there are some exceptions. And again, it's sort of the same exceptions that we saw on the previous slide that said, Again, if you have somebody from group one, it's going to be soluble. If you have somebody that has ammonium, it's going to be soluble. So if you had, for example, sodium sulfide, it's going to be soluble and not make a solid because that is group one. So these guys, again, would be the opposite, which is aqueous in this case. So what we're looking at on this page is these are things that are typically going to make solids. Obviously, except if it's one of those exceptions, and then they will not make a solid in this particular case. Any questions on this here? I would say you should have some familiarity with these rules. Yes, probably will be provided to you in some form. Um, but, you know, it's a good thing if you're continuing on in chemistry to have some knowledge of this stuff, for sure. Uh, again, it will pop back up in 1B in a big way in terms of a chapter. And it's a good thing to know, obviously, is in 1A as well. Any questions?
So if we take something like and put together, uh, we'll do, do some silver nitrate plus some sodium chloride. Why don't you take a couple of minutes here and first off complete the reaction and balance. Then while you're at it, write the total ionic equation. And while you're at it, write the net ionic equation. All right. So you can use the solubility rules on the previous page to help you decide what is aqueous, what is solid, complete the reaction, balance it, and then write each of those equations that we talked about earlier, total ionic, net ionic equation, and also identify any spectator ions. In the lab that we did the other day, um, you definitely have something like this, right? You have just the reactants that come together. So first off, you want to sort of identify, you know, what type of overall reaction we're talking about here, which probably shouldn't be too hard at this point since we've only really talked about one. But really what you should look at here is silver nitrate and understand that that is an ionic compound, which is a positive and negative guy. You also should understand at this point that sodium chloride is also an ionic compound, which is a positive and negative guy. Again, there's really only one type of reaction where you get two of those things together, and that is the double displacement reaction that we've been talking about. And as soon as you realize that, you should also realize that basically what's going to happen is our positive guy is just going to switch partners. Now, again, we want to think about putting it together correctly first and then balancing it. So when we think about what we're starting with, we want to think about the basic ions that make those guys up. Silver, which is a plus one, and nitrate, which is really a minus one. Sodium, which is a plus one, and chloride, which is a minus one. So now we really have our basis to put everybody together correctly. Uh, so we can start with our silver nitrate plus our sodium chloride. And frankly, we now know that this silver, which is plus one, should now go over with the chloride, which is minus one to give us our proper form over here, which is the silver chloride, just like we did with nomenclature, plus one, minus one, and putting it together. We also should now see that our sodium will come on over here and hook up there with our nitrate. And again, here we're taking plus one and minus one, putting it together, which gives us our proper formula of NaNO3. Any questions on how I got to the other side here? Yeah. Now, at this point, we have the proper formulas down. We want to make sure that it is balanced. And in this case, I think we're actually good in this case. We are balanced, just happen to be. We have one silver on both sides, one nitrate on both sides, one sodium on both sides, and one chloride on both sides. So this would represent our molecular equation that's balanced. We also want to use our solubility rules to understand you know, what is maybe a solid, what is not a solid, what is aqueous. So when we look at our first guy there, which is silver nitrate, although you may not find silver sort of by itself on the solubility rules, the one thing that we do see is nitrate there. And nitrate, if you look at the solubility rules, are soluble in pretty much everything. There's no exceptions, which means as soon as you see the nitrate, you automatically know that this guy is going to be soluble and should get the aqueous symbol next to it. When you look at the next one, which is sodium chloride, as soon as you hit the sodium, which is group one on the periodic table, those guys are also soluble in everything. There's no exceptions. You don't even need to go any further into that formula. You automatically know that it is going to be aqueous because the sodium is present in the formula. Now, if you wanted to go further, you could. You could go to chloride and you could also find chloride on those solubility rules and chloride, bromide, and iodides are soluble in everything except for silver, lead, or mercury, which is not the case, right? So there's no silver, lead, or mercury on the guy on the left. So it would still tell you it's soluble. So sometimes you can find both guys on the solubility table. Sometimes you can just find one on the solubility table, but you should at least be able to find one and should be able to make your determination from at least that one. And again, if you can find them both, 
they both should agree with the same, you should get the same outcome if they're both on the table. Looking at the next side, which is our silver chloride. Again, we pretty much are going to find the chloride here on the solubility table. And as I just said, chloride, bromine, and iodide are soluble in everything except for silver, lead, and mercury. Is this an exception in this case? It is an exception. So normally those guys are soluble, which means no solid. So the exception would mean the opposite, that we would expect a solid to form here. And if we did this reaction, which I think we did a number of times, probably throughout the semester, uh, that will give you your silver chloride, which would be the actual solid that you would form in this reaction. Looking at the last guy there, which is sodium. Again, as soon as we hit sodium, that's it. Don't have to go any further. It is soluble in everything. And we know automatically it is going to be aqueous. Again, if you wanted to go further, you could go to the nitrate, which if you look at the solubility rules will also tell you it is soluble in everything. Any questions on how we determine the solubility here using those rules? At this point, again, what we have up here is our balanced molecular equation. Now we wanna write our total ionic equation. So as we talked about earlier, our total ionic equation, we're going to take everything that's basically a strong electrolyte, pretty much everybody that's aqueous, unless it happens to be a weak electrolyte, we're going to break them apart into their ions. Anything that's solid and liquid or gas or a weak electrolyte will stay together. So our silver nitrate, which is a strong electrolyte, will break apart into a silver ion plus a nitrate ion. The sodium chloride, which is also aqueous, will break apart into ions as they are floating around in the solution. You will get a sodium ion and you will get a chloride ion in this case. Coming to the other side, we hit something that is solid. So as we talked about, we will not break apart the solid. So we will just keep it together in terms of its formula here, which would be the silver chloride. And again, at the end here, we have our aqueous ionic guy, which will break apart into a sodium ion and a nitrate ion, as I squeeze it in there at the end. Nitrate. Any questions on that? What we have here is our total ionic equation, our complete ionic equation. Any questions? <laughs> now, remember, once you get to the total ionic equation, that is the equation that's going to help you determine what is our spectator ions. And in this case, what are our spectator ions here? It is the sodium, the nitrate. The way that you identify that is you should have those ions on both sides. And by the way, if you do it correctly, you should have the exact same number of those ions on both sides, like two and two or one and one. So if we look, we have a nitrate on the left and a badly scribbled nitrate there in the corner, which is exactly the same. We have a sodium on the left and a sodium on the right. So our spectator ions in this case is the sodium ions and the nitrate ions. That does make sense because sodium and nitrate are very much soluble in everything, which means they're not gonna make a solid. They're just gonna sit in the solution, floating around, having a good time. Yeah, just kind of floating around, still in the solution. And what we do with those, as we talked about, is essentially cross them out on both sides. And that will then leave us our third type of equation, which is our net ionic equation. And in this case, what is truly happening when you dump both of those solutions together is the silver ion from the silver nitrate as it's floating around in the solution has a good attraction to the chloride ion, which is also floating around in the solution. And they're basically going to come together to make our silver chloride solid, which is a white solid, which I think we've made before. And this again is what is referred to as the net ionic equation which really describes ultimately the reaction is taking place. And also what is really happening in this reaction, right, is the formation of a solid, which is one of the driving forces for why a chemical reaction takes place is this formation of the solid in this case. Any questions on any of those steps? Couple of things that people screw up on these equations is, 
they go to write a total ionic equation or a net ionic equation, and they don't write the formulas with charges. Yes, so obviously in this case, the silver has a charge, uh, the nitrate has a charge, the sodium has a charge. That's why they're called total ionic equation ion. So you got to make sure you include the charges as you're writing them. Obviously the net ionic equation should also have the charges in there, but just like normal, our solid, which is not ions free, should not have a charge, right? So when we put the positive and negative guy together, no charge, but individually writing the ions that have positive and negative charges, you do need to include the charges and usually the states. In this case, you would want to include like aqueous or solid and stuff like that. Any questions on any of those steps there? <laughs> Okay, so I think we will lay it up there for today.